All right. Okay. Let's make sure the pointer's working good. All right. Welcome back to Structural Analysis Lecture 7. We are done with our discussion of reactions. Um, I think at this point you can handle or should be able to handle just about any load that I throw at you, just about any boundary condition that I throw at you. Um, and I think at this point, you know, we, we've covered what we need to cover. Um, one of the purposes of covering the reactions topic first um, in the way that we cover it is that it does sort of shake the rust off of the, uh, the statics muscles that you have, if you will. And so at this point, I believe that you've got um, enough um, uh, uh, practice that we can start doing some real stuff in here. And so we're going to start with trusses. Um, now, uh, I had mentioned uh, that there was like a little typo in my uh, schedule, my, my breakdown schedule throughout the, um, uh, uh, th you know, at the end of the syllabus, because I said we were going to have another, or we were going to start trusses uh, earlier than we did. I had always intended that we were going to have four reactions lectures. So I decided, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and, and post uh, the schedule between now and the first exam. Uh, because the idea is that the first exam, we will cover all the stuff we've done up until now, the classification of structures, reactions, and trusses. That's going to be the first exam. Um, now, uh, one thing that I did uh, call an audible on was on Friday, September 17th. Um, originally, I had decided that I was going to cover the, um, the analysis project on the 17th. Um, but as I started looking at the topics we have left between now and the first exam, I realized that if I was going to do that, I would be crunching our deflections coverage, and I don't really want to do that. Um, I want to give deflections its fair uh, uh, share of, of uh, time in the sun, if you will. So what I'm going to do is, uh, if you remember, um, Friday, September 17th, and I would imagine that most of your engineering professors are already telling you this if they haven't, but uh, we're, we shouldn't be having engineering courses on Friday, se uh, September 17th, because we all have an event, the, the faculty does uh, that day. So I'm going to pre-record a lecture on Friday, September 17th that's going to discuss what's called the method of virtual work. Um, it's going to be a little theory heavy, but um, the idea is that if there's any lecture that we pre-record, that's going to be the perfect one to do uh, because it's going to set the stage for how we do trust deflections. And if you understand how to do trust analysis, trust deflections is no more difficult. It's actually just sort of the same thing, just a little bit more. So it's the perfect lecture to do um, uh, that day. And then when we uh, finish the exam, we'll come back Monday, and Monday I'll talk about the analysis project because the analysis project isn't due until November. So it's not like we're in any hurry to, uh, to discuss it. So I think that makes uh, the most sense uh, globally about the class. Any questions? All right. In terms of other announcements, your grades are up to date. Uh, homework 2.3 uh, is uh, graded. The solution's posted. Uh, homework or the attendance grades are up to date. 2.4 is due today. And your first trust assignment is going to be assigned today. So let's start talking about trusses. Um, this is a course in structural analysis, and so it's finally time we start analyzing some structures. I mean, up until now, we've been sort of uh, dusting off our, our uh, 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 skills and statics in order to determine support reactions, which is necessary. I mean, you need to be able to determine the external forces required to keep the structure in equilibrium. But that doesn't really get you far enough in terms of structural engineering. You need to be able to assess the internal forces inside a system uh, really for the purposes of design. I mean, the idea is if I've got this uh, plain truss here and I know how much force, let's say, this little member right here is carrying, I can then ask the next question. What does that member need to be in order to safely carry that load? Is it a W10 by 49? Is it a W12 by 50? What have you. I can then go through the process of design. I can then you know, start going a little further. How many bolts need to be on this connection in order to safely resist that load? How thick does the gusset plate need to be? Et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's design. That's what design is. Um, and so we're going to start our structural analysis tasks in this course with trusses. Why trusses? Well, um, let's talk a little bit just about trusses. Uh, 
just to sort of define it so that everybody understands what a truss is, Trusses are arrangements of uh, member of straight members, uh, more often than not in triangular patterns to, to form a structure. If there's any one characteristic about trusses that is pretty universal, it's that trusses are triangular arrangements uh, of members. And they are very, very um, common uh, in structural engineering applications. Two very common applications are roof elements. Um, you know, this might be more of a traditional element that you might see in a residential or commercial facility. Um, you also see truss elements in commercial facilities and even industrial facilities. How many of you have been to Walmart? Have you looked up? Take a look up next time you're in Walmart and you will probably see a combination of both beams and truss elements utilized to safely resist those loads. How many of you have been inside the basketball area at the rec center? Look up. Boom. You know, so uh, there you go. Uh, they're also very, very common uh, in bridge applications, particularly uh, in bridges. Trusses tend to get used when the spans are very, very long. You don't see a lot of truss uh, applications in relatively short spans. There are reasons for that I'm going to get into shortly, but that's, that's basically where you see uh, trust is utilized. You see them using buildings, bridges, they're very, very common. Um, actually, let, let's talk about that. Why are trusses uh, common? What are the advantages and disadvantages of using trusses? Um, and so I'm getting a little bit into design land here, but I want to explain the advantages and disadvantages. So what are the advantages of trusses? Well, number one, they tend to be very, very lightweight. Um, when you compare, like let's just take this application over here on the right, this bridge application. Um, that is a very, very lightweight system when you compare it to its um, beam alternative. In order to design a beam to resist the same span or to be able to support the same span, you're going to have a really big beam. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really big. Uh, whereas trusses are very lightweight. Another advantage of uh, trusses is that they uh, carry a high degree of stiffness. Okay. Now, I'm, uh, you probably right now would think of stiffness and strength interchangeably. Like, oh, that's the same thing. No, it's not, okay? Strength is how much load the, uh, the element or the system or the members can safely support before the system fails or before the system exceeds safety limitations. That's what strength is. Stiffness is the ability to withstand deflections. In other words, uh, if you have... Um, two structures, all things being equal in terms of load and geometry, but one is stiffer than the other, it will deflect less, okay? So there is a difference between deflections and, and strength, okay? And that's a, a big topic in structural design courses. If you take reinforced concrete design or structural steel design, that's a, a big thing we talk about is the difference between, you know, strength limit states and service limit states. So the advantages of trusses are that they're very lightweight and they're very stiff. What are the disadvantages? This is the disadvantage right here. They're pricey. They're pricey because you have a lot of members, a lot of connections, a lot of funky details. This is one of the reasons why you don't see trusses on like simple short span applications. I can just take a beam, set it in, and I'm done. You know. So from a fabrication perspective and a construction perspective, trusses are complicated. So if you're going to use them, there better be a good reason to use them. Okay. So that's sort of the, the trade-off. Um, so yeah, any questions about trusses? I talk about this stuff all day. So, all right. Now let's talk about um, our assumptions. If you remember at the beginning of the semester, I talked about how we don't analyze structures; we analyze mathematical models that represent structures. And so. When we develop analytical models to represent trusses, we make some assumptions. And particularly, we make the following three assumptions. So number one, we assume that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints. So we're not considering friction or any other secondary effects uh, into the, uh, the main supporting elements of the system. Uh, number two, we consider that all of the loads and support reactions are only applied at the joints. Now, this is actually going to be kind of an important characteristic of how we analyze the truss in our analysis project, because I'm going to give you a truss, and I'm going to say, here's the truss, and it must support 
you know, I don't know, X pounds per square foot. And so what you're going to have to do is take that load and distribute it to each joint when you do your analysis. But we'll talk about that. That's after the first exam, so we don't have to worry about that now. But the third one is that each joint, at each joint, the centroids of each of the members coincide. And that's something that we actually can control from a fabrication standpoint. If you look here at this image, oh yeah, I forgot laser pointer on the TV. Um, if you look here at this image, so let's take this member right here. You know, the centroid is probably about like right there. And the centroid of this member is about like right there. And the centroid of that member is about like right there, et cetera. That's not by accident. That's actually by design. Uh, uh, fabricators will detail the connections and the members such that the centroids of the members coincide. Okay? The reason why is that if all of the centroids coincide and all the loads are applied directly at those joints and there's no friction or anything, then what you have is a concurrent force system, okay? Um, if you remember uh, from statics last year, if you had me for statics, this is one of the very first things that we discussed in statics was statics of particles, right? The idea that all of the forces all met at a common point, okay? And the reason why um, that was sort of where you started in statics was because if all of the forces all meet at a common point, what doesn't exist in the system? Moments, right? Moments are when the forces don't meet at a common point, okay? So what that does from the internal mechanisms of the truss is that if you have all the centroids coinciding at the joint and the loads applied at the joint and no friction or anything like that, then the members only experience axial load, okay? No shear and no moment. Now, let's be real. You know, nothing's absolute in the real world. You know, like we have these... Um, connections and we idealize them as like fixed supports and pen supports. Nothing in this world's perfectly fixed. Nothing in this world's perfectly penned. There's always going to be, you know, a little bit of those uh, additional forces. But the idea is that by uh, adhering to these three principles, you substantially reduce the shear and moment at the connection so that all you deal with is axial load. How does that affect the analysis? Well, it does this. If you remember, if you break out your secret weapon of structural engineering, which is a samurai sword or a lightsaber, if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, and you cut a section through a structure at an arbitrary point, um, inside the element, you can get at most three unknown forces. An unknown force in the x direction, unknown force in the y direction, unknown moment. Or, if we're talking about along the member, an unknown axial force, an unknown shear, and an unknown moment. But because of the way that we're dealing with trusses, we've made some very particular assumptions about how those trusses behave. Um, we, again, members, uh, co uh, centroids coinciding at the joints, loads applied at the joints, no friction. All we have are axial loads inside the members. So whenever we do method of joints or method of sections or any of these analyses, we're only going to consider axial loads. It's going to make the analysis a lot easier. Now, and, and again, even though nothing uh, is perfect in the real world, there's always a little bit of shear and a little bit of moment, these assumptions work very, very well when capturing the real world behavior of these types of systems. I have gone out in the field and run, you know, loaded trucks on highway bridges that were trusses, measured the strains and compared them to get this against this, and they work quite well. So this does capture real, real world response. Blech. Okay. Let's talk about the actual methods for analyzing the trusses. So there are two methods of disposal at, at our disposal as engineers, uh, and that is the method of joints and the method of sections. Now I'm going to go ahead and just be frank. I spend the vast amount of my time in this course focusing on the method of joints because I think as an engineer, that's what you need to be good at um, for a few reasons. One, um, if you're designing a truss, you're not going to design some of it. You're designing all the, the whole system, right? You need to know what's going on in the entire system. That's what the method of joints does for you. It is tedious, don't get me wrong, um, but it will give you the results for the entire structure. That's what the method of joints is for. Um, the other reason why the method of joints is valuable is even if you're only interested in computing deflections at one point, which we'll talk about deflections later. But in order to compute deflections, you need to completely analyze the truss. 
And while method of joints is tedious, it's thorough. It works. So we have three lectures dedicated to the method of joints. So why would I show you the method of sections? Um, well, there's two reasons. Well, actually, let me take that back. Three reasons why I would show you the, the method of sections. Method number one. There are some instances where the method of sections is easier with dealing with particular geometric challenges. So uh, that'll become clear later on. But when, whenever we have like joints with two diagonals and whatnot, um, instead of breaking out the two by two equation solver on our Casio FX 115 ES Plus, we can utilize the method of sections to make our life a little easier. Um, somebody's calling me on Teams. That's going to show up in the recording. I'll call you back, whoever that was. That'll be funny. You were on my recording, and I hung up on you. I got a call from the same number when the class started. You did too? Yeah, that same number. You did? Yeah, I just found like five minutes ago. So right before class started, did anybody get some phishing emails? I like, well, there are a bunch of staff members up in the office. We got the same email like four or five different times. They were phishing attempts. I something that I think that was why, because they probably sent that because, I mean, like, I, I got it, and then I got it again, and got it again, and got it again. And I was like, this is crazy. And then I went to one of the secretaries. I said, have you been getting these emails? She's like, yes. You know, so... You know, they're coming out with a new Matrix movie, maybe. Yeah. Crazy marketing campaigns. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, all right. So what was, what was I talking about? Oh, reasons for the method of sections. So number one, the method of sections can serve as a, um, a means of simplifying joints analyses when you've got some real wonky geometry in a truss. That's reason one. Reason two, spot check. If you're just wanting to check an answer, like, hold on, is this right? Do a quick method of sections analysis. Reason three, why would you utilize the method of sections? If I want to find the force in this one member, method of joints would be pretty tedious. But if I want to use method of sections, it's pretty quick. Can anybody think of an environment um, that's going to affect your lives very soon where... Um, you've got a truss problem, and you need to find the truss force in one random member. An what type of exam? Not just this class, but an FE exam. So the, the method of sections tends to be pretty powerful for the FE exam, because I guarantee you, you're going to get a problem that says, here's a truss, what's the force in this member? Like, it's going to happen, you know. So the method of sections works pretty well for the FE. All right. Now, now my remote doesn't like me now that the person called me. Let me try this. There we go. That's better. Okay, so let's dig into the method of joints. So um, you've used this in statics, but I don't think we really dug into it the way that we should as civil engineers, so we're really going to dig into it. So as stated, the way that the method of joints works is we investigate each joint one by one, and we write the equations of equilibrium for that joint to solve for the unknowns at that joint, and then we move on to the next joint. And we just keep doing this over and over again until the entire structure is solved. Now, going back to the assumptions that we made, um, all the centroids coincide, the loads are applied at the joints, no friction, etc. we only have two equations of equilibrium. We don't have three when we're looking at joints. Um, we can only deal with sum of forces in the x direction. We can only deal with sum of forces in the y direction. Um, as such, um, we can only start our method of joints analysis when we have a, a, a joint with, at most, two unknown uh, um, uh, members. And you'll understand what I mean by that very, very quickly when we look into our example. Uh, but basically, you have to be choosy as to where you can start, because you can only deal with, at most, two unknowns at a time, because you only have two equations of equilibrium. Speaking of, let's look at this example. So this is going to be the example that we do today. Um, and I want to say a couple things about this example before we get into it. The first and most glaringly obvious thing that you should notice are what's going on down here. I gave you the support reactions. 
Is that okay at this point? Because I want to get into the truss analysis stuff, and I'm just telling you that this reaction is 15 kips to the left, this reaction is 12 and a half kips up, this reaction is 17 and a half kips up. If you do not believe me, solve it, you know. But, I mean, this should be pretty, uh, let's look at sum of forces in the x direction. I got 15 kips to the right, got to have 15 kips going to the left. What about the y direction? 10, 20, I got 30 going down, 12 and a half, 17 and a half, I got 30 going up. So, at, at a minimum, it should at least pass the gut check. If you want to do sum of moments today, go ahead, you know. Um, I, I'm going to start doing this periodically moving forward. In other words, we've done reactions. I think it would just eat time in class to do them again. Okay? Everybody okay with that? All right. That's number one. Number two, look at the diagonal members. All of the diagonal members are oriented at the same slope ratio. They're all at a three to four slope ratio. And I did that for this particular problem to simplify that component of it. The next example that we do uh, on Friday will have diagonals oriented at different slope ratios, okay? Because um, it, it doesn't make it any more difficult, it just makes it more of a bookkeeping exercise. And I don't want this to, to start off our discussion of trusses to start off with the most complicated problems. I like to start easy and then make it a little bit harder as we go on, you know? And by the end, the idea is that by the end, by the time we're done with this, you can handle any truss with any load on it, provided it's statically determinate. And we'll talk about static indeterminacy on Friday. Any questions? All right, let's get into it. All right, so here's our, our uh, member, here's our truss. And the first thing I want to point out is what I have drawn here on the board. Now, for those of you watching the recording, obviously you can't see that. But all I've done is I've sort of just redrawn the truss here, and I've uh, separated out the members because I'm going to record my joint analyses up here so that they're all in one location. So there's nothing that's on the board that you aren't going to see on the screen. It's just maybe a, a little bit of a handy reference for us. Okay? I do have something drawn over here on this board but I'll reference that here in a bit. Okay, now in order to uh, solve uh, a truss utilizing the method of joints, if you remember, we start out with a joint that has at most two unknowns. So my question for you, could we start out by analyzing joint B? No, we cannot start with analyzing joint B because how many unknown member forces go through joint B? Four, right? This member, this member, this member, and this member. That doesn't mean I will never be able to solve joint B. Of course I'll be able to solve joint B at some point, but I gotta know two of them before I solve the other two. Make sense? I gotta start out with something where there's at most two unknowns. Can anybody give me a joint where there's only two unknowns? A or joint C, right? So I could start off with joint A or joint C in order to uh, assess this problem. I'm feeling alphabetical today, so let's start off at joint A, okay? So what we'll do is we will analyze joint A, okay? Now we'll take our time with it. All right, so let's start off with joint A. So the first thing I like to do with, uh, whenever I do a joint analysis is start off, draw the members. So here's the joint, we have a horizontal member and a diagonal member. And notice that this is at a three to four slope ratio. Okay, we'll handle that here in a bit. Next, I want to draw the forces that I know are being applied to joint A. How many forces are being applied to joint A right now? Joint A? Yeah, just these two, right? Just the joint. So we've got this horizontal reaction here and this vertical reaction here. So what I'll do is I will say, okay, I have a 
horizontal force here of 15 kips and a vertical force of 12 and a half kips. <clears throat> okay. Now remember, these are all concurrent force systems, so they all go through this point, so no moments. Okay. And remember, reactions, they're just forces going through the joints. They're just a specially computed force such that the equilibrium of the structure is maintained. But it's still just a force like any other. Now, the unknowns. Let's talk about the unknowns. All right. So I have two unknown members. So the way I like to do this is, let's start off with this one right here, this horizontal member. I'm going to sort of write this sort of dashed line, say, okay, I've got this unknown force here. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's going to the left or to the right or up or down. But I know I've got an unknown force here, and I'm going to call it AB. Why am I calling it AB? Because it's the force inside member AB. I don't care if you do the F sub AB or AB. I just keep it simple. You know. All right. Now I've got a diagonal. For the diagonal, what I like to do is split the diagonal up into X and Y components. So something like that. And what we'll do, we'll call this ADX, ADY. And so there's this joint completely sort of figured out. This is the complete free body diagram of this joint. We've got the joint, all the members going through the joint, all the known forces, and all the unknown forces. That's the joint. That's half the battle right there, as G.I. Joe would say, knowing what's going on. Nobody gets the reference, G.I. Joe, knowing what's happening. <sighs> Kids with your music. Okay. Somebody gets that reference. Okay, so now let's start looking at, at solution. How many unknown force components do I have in the x direction? Two. Two. How many unknown force components do I have in the horizontal or in the vertical direction? One. One. So let's deal with that first. Remember, I have two equations of equilibrium. So let's utilize the sum of forces in the y direction. Now, the, the beauty of, of joints analyses is that this isn't that complicated. It's usually pretty simple. Can anybody tell me, just by looking at this structure, what is ADY? All right. Let's start off magnitude first. What's the magnitude, the value? 12.5 kips. In what direction? Down. Simple, right? Okay, so let me show you a couple things I'm going to do. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my diagram and I'm going to put that little down arrow indicating that that is actually going down. Okay, just so that I have record of it. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, all right, 12.5 kips. I just put that here for, for posterity's sake. And you'll see why I'm doing this over here, here in a second. So far, so good? Now, any questions? Okay. Now, we have two unknown horizontals. How are we going to deal with that? Well, here's the habit I want you to start getting yourself in. Let's look at this diagonal member. Because there is only axial load present in the diagonal, if I know one component, I can very easily determine the other component. All right, right there. So what I am proposing is that whenever you have a diagonal member, the horizontal and vertical component are always related. So if you know one, you can, you can compute the other. And how do you compute the other one? You use the slope ratio. Now, 
Unlike inclined loads, this is really easy. All right. So the slope ratio. If you know ADY, you can compute ADX. Now, in order to compute ADX, what we're going to do is we're going to take ADY and we're going to multiply it by a fraction. Now, I'll give you two choices for the fraction. It's either 3 over 4 or it's 4 over 3. Which is it? 3 over 4 or 4 over 3? Three? 3 over 4. All you do is say the horizontal component's what I'm looking for. That's what goes on top. It's that simple. So, what is 12 and a half times 3 quarters? Bless you. What is 12 and a half times 3 quarters? Anybody have an answer for me? <clears throat> So, what is it, like 9.375? Something like that? Do I have a second on that? Okay. Now, that's the magnitude. What about the direction? Is it going to the left or to the right? To the right. How many people? You're saying left? Or what? Which? Okay. Who's saying right? You're saying right. You're saying right. Right. Okay. That's not right. It's left. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about that. It's going to the left. Okay. And now this is going to illustrate what's going on here. Okay. So actually let me, in order to illustrate this, let me draw a joint here on either end or on the opposite end. Okay, so what I have here is just a little diagram to help you understand what's going on. Okay, so let's go back to what we're trying to do here with trusses. We're trying to solve for the internal forces inside a truss. So what we're trying to figure out is whether or not the members are experiencing compression or tension. tension. Compression. What does compression mean? It means pushing towards the joint. Here's the joint pushing towards the joint, right? Tension. Here's the joint yanking away from the joint, right? The idea is if I've got this diagonal member and I've got the X and Y components, they're either both yanking away from the joint or they're both pushing towards the joint. These would be correct. This is not correct. Not happy. This would not be correct. They're either both pushing towards the joint or they're both pushing away from the joint. It's either compression or it's tension. It's not both. Okay. What it would mean is if there were both what you would be saying if you did this is you would be saying that there is some internal shear inside the member. And that would violate what we're talking about. When we analyze trusses, we're saying it's only axial force. And so for it to adhere to that assumption, they're either both yanking away or both pushing towards. Hence why I drew it like this. They're both pushing towards. And you're going to see in the end how it all works out. It all works out in the end. The beauty of a truss analysis, and this will become clear as we finish the problem, is that the truss has a way of self-verifying the answer. It's pretty cool. Does that make sense? So that means ADX is going this way. So here's the drum roll, $64,000 question. What is AB? First off, magnitude. What's the magnitude of AB? Hold on. Is it 15? What all do we have going to the left? 15 
and that. 24.375. Do I have a second on that? What direction? To the right. That is your joint analysis right there. So, sorry, so that's going 24.375. Boom. And so that's just me redrawing it so I have it. Now, before we close this joint analysis out, I do want to make some final uh, conclusions. We know the force ADY. We know the force ADX. How do we find AD? Break out the advice that Pythagoras gave us, right? The Pythagorean theorem, right? So exactly right. So let's do that, just, just so that we have it. We actually won't utilize AD for the problem anymore, but we need it to report our final answer. Anybody have an answer on that? 15.625. Do I have a second? Good? All right. 15.625. Fifteen point six two five. So, before I move on to the next joint, A, B is experiencing 24.375 kips and is it tension or compression? AB. Tension. There's the joint, there's AB. It's yanking away from the joint. It's in tension. AD is experiencing 15.625 kips. Tension or compression? Compression. Boom. There's your joint. So far, so good? Any questions before we move on to the next joint? This important stuff. Okay. Now, let's go back to my little diagram up here. So this is joint A. This is joint B, this is joint C, D, E. Let's look at this joint. How many unknowns are on that joint? That's right, two, right? Because originally we would have said three, but we know what's going on with this one, right? Now, let's see if y'all are paying attention. We know that horizontal is 9.375 kips. We know this vertical is 12.5 kips. Let's look at the vertical. Which way should I draw this vertical arrow? Up. Exactly. Which way should I draw the horizontal? To the right. There you go. Exactly right. Two principles to keep in mind. The arrows are either both pointing towards the joint or they're both pointing away from the joint. That's first. Number two. This member is in compression. So over here, they push towards the joint. Over here, they push towards the joint. If I'm holding a log and Mr. Page is holding a log and we want to apply compression to that log, we're doing this. He's pushing this way, I'm pushing this way. Equal and opposite. So if the arrows are going down and to the left here, they're going up and to the right there. Equal and opposite. Make sense? Now... Let's look at joint B. Jo or sorry, joint D. Joint D. Yep. 
And you can't do joint B yet. We will be able to, but not yet. So joint D. Here's the joint. We have a member, a member, a member. Are there any loads on joint D? There you go. Ten kips going down. And we do know the internal forces inside that member here. This is uh, ADX, 9.375 kips. This is 12.5 kips. What we don't know is that, that, and that. So we'll name them DE, BDX, BDY. And there's the free body diagram of our truss uh, defined, except for, I forgot something. Uh, forgot my slope ratio. That would be a mistake, but then again, I caught it. Remember, Marshall University policy says I'm allowed seven mistakes per semester. Well, but it's I only count it as like like maybe 0.01. That's what's corrupt about it. See, I'm the one that counts the mistakes. That's so I never hit seven. I get close, but I never hit hit seven. I've never asked, so I just go with per class. <laughs> what's that? I never do though. That's the thing. See, I'm the one that tracks it. It's, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll remember that, by the way. <laughs> All right. How many unknowns in the horizontal direction? How many unknowns in the vertical? So let's start off with some of forces in the y direction. Let's deal with that first. So can anybody tell me what is this vertical force? What's the magnitude of it? 2.5 kips in what direction? Hold on, we got some discrepancies there. Up or down? Down. This is 12 and a half up. This is 10 down. We need an extra two and a half down to attain equilibrium. So this is going down. BDY. Two and a half kips going down. Again, now what's the next step? If I, the slope ratio, exactly. If I know BDY, I could use BD, uh, use the slope ratio to get BDX. So BDX, it's going to be BDY times a fraction. What is that fraction? Three over four. So here's the, the big thing to keep in mind. Why am I not using the 5? If it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle, why am I not using the 5? The 5 is related to the hypotenuse. And I am going to solve for the hypotenuse at the end. Because I do square root of BDX squared plus BDY squared. Right now, I'm just looking for the legs. So that's why all I use are the 3 and the 4. So what does the value of this come out to be? 1.875. And for this problem, first off, in real life, the, the forces wouldn't come out this neat. I'm actually tracking the decimals because I want to show you what happens at the very end. Left or right? Right. They're both yanking away from the joint, or they're both pointing towards the joint. All right. DE. What's going on with DE? What's the magnitude? In order to do that, I need to sum forces in the x direction. So what is that? So I've got this going to the right and this going to the right. So what's the deal with this? 11.25 in what direction? And so while I have it, let's do this. Okay. 
just so I have it. Now, before we close this out, what's that come out to be? 3.125. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. Let's look at compression or tension. Oh, we're running we're running short on time. All right, BD, compression or tension? Tension. This is compression. All right. This always happens with trust problems is that just the time gets us. So now I'm going to show you what I'll do to finish this out. But um, before we leave, I want to stop for a sec and see if anybody has any questions on what we've done so far. OK. Now, let me ask a question. How many members does this trust have total? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, that's right, it's fine, it's fine. This is interesting. Hold on. So you're telling me seven members. So each joint I've been solving for two. What's going to happen at the last joint? There's only going to be one member, right? I'm, so look, we're, we're not going to have time to do this in class now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just record a little snippet where I finish it out and show you what happens at the end. What happens at the end is that when you get to the last member, if it is a diagonal, which in many cases it is, and you solve for the x and y components separately, you'll get an answer. And it might be like, I'll just make it up. 12 kips and 9 kips. So you do sum of forces in the y direction and you get 12 kips, sum of forces in the x direction and you get 9 kips. What's 9 divided by 12? 3 fourths. What's the slope ratio for all the diagonal members in this problem? 3 fourths. So you'll find that at that very last member, if you do it independently, you'll see that it sort of self corrects. Okay? If you understood what we did today, You'll be able to do the homework, no problem, because it's just the same stuff, just you keep going with it. Any questions? I have one final thing to say, and then we'll call it. All right. This problem is only doable because the truss is not only externally stable and determinate, but internally stable and determinate. What does that mean? We'll talk about that on Friday. That's all I got.